Spotify. Healthcare tech company Clover Health reported record revenue in its latest earnings report out earlier this week. Uh, but the stock's still down here a bit, off by about 50% since its SPAC merger back in January, uh, and still down after it got hit with that bearish report from short seller Hindenburg Research. But there's one thing its president says it doesn't want to be criticized for, and that's the company's decision to hire tech workers abroad. In an open letter on LinkedIn uh, titled, uh, quote, I don't want to apologize for being Asian anymore, Clover Health President and Chief Technology Officer uh, responded to a reporter's question about hiring, quote, cheaper coders in Hong Kong, writing, we hire in Hong Kong because there's intensely strong talent there, and we hire where we believe we can get great people. So joining us now for more on that is Andrew Toy, Clover Health President and CTO, alongside us uh, with Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani here. Uh, and Andrew, appreciate you coming on to chat. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I understand you're born in Hong Kong. You came to the U.S. to, to go to school at Stanford. Uh, questions around hiring tech abroad, always very interesting. Uh, but what was kind of your reaction to getting asked about it and, and why Clover Health looks abroad for talent? Absolutely. Th thanks for having me on. Um, and yeah, like, you know, as you said, I grew up in Hong Kong. Um, I started programming there myself uh, in Hong Kong. I came to the, the U.S. to go to college and, and, and continue my studies here. Um, so it was really interesting to me that uh, and, and that this is so pervasive in terms of an opinion about what it's like to, you know, work overseas or why you would actually seek talent overseas. Um, it's something that really I've encountered my entire career, even for myself. Um, as I mentioned in my post, like I often get complimented and I think people mean this in a nice way, but I get complimented by how well I speak English. People will say, wow, Andrew, you know, you speak English so well. And, uh, and I hope that I do. But also it's just interesting to me that people would feel like that's something worthy of comment or uh, to actually compliment me on. Um, as I believe, you know, we're moving forward as a society Talent is distributed across the entire world. Um, we seek talent wherever we can um, We can find it. Obviously, I am familiar with Hong Kong. We have great Cloverites and uh, engineers uh, who work over there. Um, and we see them as the same as the Cloverites who work in the US, just as we don't see a difference between people who are in our New York office versus being uh, you know, over in, in California. We believe very much in a distributed culture, um, a distributed culture of work. And I think that's even now accentuated by the move to um, having people work outside of the office, which obviously was brought upon by the, by the pandemic. But mm -hmm. by having a culture where all the way from leadership to the way you look for talent to the way you bring it uh, bring, bring folks on having this idea of having a decentralized work culture having not the idea that you're even uh, uh centralized around an office or that you are yeah. remote or not remote from an office we really believe that this gives us an ability to bring in a diverse set of opinions seek talent wherever we can find and recruit it, which is great for the business, and have yeah. a wide range right. of viewpoints to serve our membership. Absolutely, Andrew, and I wanna talk about that because that's specifically part of the issue, right, is in this remote work environment, we're seeing more and more uh, people saying that there are there are great uh, you know, tech talent out there, and it's not just focused on that Bay Area, and so, the, and so looking abroad is also, should be an option, especially now as we see how much uh, focus is on remote work. But tell me about the Asian part of it specifically, because of course, there have been criticisms over the years that China and India have largely been, uh, you know, the draws for those H-1B visas. And that is really the core of the talent here in the U.S. So how does going abroad to Hong Kong specifically, and especially with their current political environment, uh, a, a good idea? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, speaking to, to Asia, well, first of all, of course, you know, like we have familiarity with uh, with Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very, I think, special place within even the context, as you said, Anjali, uh, within the, the relationship of the U.S. with, with China. It is at all, at, with the U.K., right, because of its history. Um, it has always been at a very specific intersection culturally. Um, it is a very multicultural city. It knows it's a multicultural city. It, it brings all the best parts of those um, various countries together. Um, and that, I think, has is a makes it a very uh, powerful place to attract talent and to recruit talent because you can get those diverse 
points of view, right? And so we very specifically thought about this, and there, there is a reason that we could be targeted and, and launched an office in Hong Kong versus, say, on, on the mainland. There's great talent in China as well, but that intersection of cultures in Hong Kong is really, really special. And so I think that Hong Kong has a, a place where even when you look at things like visas, um, you know, the U.S. has a different categorization from people for Hong Kong versus from the mainland. And you see that even in the policies that, that, that address that. On, on a broader basis, I think that there is a difficulty where people look at certain markets like they look at like they, like they look at India, they look at China and they say, Say, hey, there's a lot again, there's a sort of a, a subtle xenophobia to saying that yeah. we're scared of people who come from those areas. I, I really think that's a difficult thing for me to process because it's casting an incredibly large number of people in the world with a very, very broad brush. And it makes a lot more sense to just think about it as where can we find people who want to work on, a, on, a, on our mission, who are passionate about our mission, who can help us deliver upon it, and then seek those sources of talent. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I guess putting the, the Hong Kong issue aside here to focus back on the business, since I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily playing into the, some of the stock moves we saw. Uh, but when we look at some of the other criticisms uh, since the SPAC merger uh, back in January, there were issues around maybe uh, disclosing some inquiries from the DOJ uh, about the business, the SEC taking a look at some things. One thing that stood out for me when we heard from Chamath uh, around the time of the SPAC was talking about the business uh, growth there for direct uh, contracting when it comes to the way that you guys work on your Medicare programs. Uh, 200,000, I think, was the number he threw out back then. And on, our, on the earnings call this week, got the number that uh, the company expects to have about half that number or even less. Talk to me about maybe projections there at Clover Health and what you're seeing now in regards to that. Absolutely. So uh, on, on, with regards to direct contracting, um, we still have stated and guided that we still have availability and can get up to 200,000 plus, which is what we had always said. So I think it comes down to just the details of what numbers we are providing as the program launches. It's a brand new program from the government. What it does is, is it allows uh, uh, companies to access what is traditionally called fee for service or, or regional Medicare, uh, uh, people who have signed up for that within the Medicare program. Traditionally, we've been in Medicare Advantage. And so as we launched this program, we're one of a limited number of companies who have been selected to participate. And we knew that for a while back. Um, as we've been getting more information about the program, we've been binding what we get from the government, which is the latest numbers we provided are what CMS and our regulator, the government, has said are in now in our direct contracting entity. We are then combining that with data that we get from the uh, physician partners that we have who are in our direct contracting entity, and they have a different view of the data, which is that larger 200,000 plus number, and then the reality will be somewhere in between. The minimum that we will have are the folks who have been already assigned to us by the government. That's the number we only recently had, and that's what we've shared. The number that we have available via our physician partners and their data is that larger 200,000 plus number. And we won't know the final number until we run through this first year of the program. And that number will be somewhere in between. And obviously, we don't know that final number yet. All right. Some important context there. And we know that you'll be working on that, not with just workers here in the U.S., but also uh, abroad in Hong Kong. But Andrew Toy, I appreciate you coming on here to chat with us. Clover Health President and CTO alongside Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani. Uh, thanks as well.